Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to UTS. My name's Andrew Parfit, and I'm the Vice-Chancellor here. And it's uh, a great privilege today to be hosting uh, what is my first um, UTS Vice-Chancellor's Democracy Forum. So before we begin, though, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. They are the owners of the land on which the campus stands, always have been and always will be, and pay respect to elders past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. And as this week is NAIDOC week, um, this is a really important time to celebrate the contribution our Indigenous colleagues make to the life of the university. And also, um, with the pathway now clear for the, uh, for the road from the Uluru Statement of the Heart to a constitutional recognition, we have a, a moment in time here to very significantly uh, recognise the First Nations people with a proper place uh, in our constitution and our community. So thank you for coming today. Um, as you may know, the event's the third in a series of annual talks and discussions focused on the critical themes of democracy, engaged citizenship, public purpose and social cohesion. And this is a topic of significant interest to all of us at UTS, both at a personal level for me, because I believe fundamentally in the role that universities have as public institutions delivering public benefit to a wide cross-section of the university, uh, of the community, but also I think to many of us who see the role of universities as being social transformers. We encourage our students to be active participants in their communities, to become global citizens who are grounded in their studies and careers and create positive impact. I'll just make a little pause here to start talk about the next event. Uh, I think Roy mentioned that it's a bit like uh, the bus timetable. We, we go for a long period without the democracy forum. We've got two within a couple of weeks. Uh, but the next event in the series will be held via Zoom on Tuesday the 12th of July with Professor Lee Ippi. Um, who's a professor of P political theory in the government department at the London School of Economics uh, and an adjunct associate professor of philosophy at the Australian National University as well. And we'll be a lot delighted to hear from her. You can find the event and book your place if you want to attend that one online at the UTS website. But coming back to this evening, in a short while I'll introduce Emeritus Professor Roy Green, who will in turn introduce the guest speakers, Professor Joe Stiglitz, an economist, public policy analyst, and professor at Columbia University, and Professor Michelle Bradley, who's our Associate Dean Research and Development here at UTS in the UTS Business School. They'll be examining the role government plays in shaping post-COVID recovery, innovation, and social outcomes in Australia. There's no doubt that we are still experiencing the pandemic in one form or another. Our health system, community structures, and economy have been severely impacted and jobs and labour force participation are not fully recovered, not to mention the skills shortage that we're still suffering for a range of different reasons. But in all of this, the poorest and most marginalised in our communities feel these impacts the most. Adding to the challenges of the recovery are climate change issues, global unrest, resource depletion, the list goes on. So conversations are needed now on how we move forward addressing inequalities in our society and future-proofing our communities. Australia's economic recovery must be a collaborative effort between governments, industry, education institutions and communities. Since UTS is a university of technology, it would be remiss of me not to actually mention uh, technology. COVID, of course, has sped up the digital transformation in so many ways, and technologies, not just in the health sector, but across a range of industries, are becoming more prevalent into some of the solutions we have to tackle. The new normal sees individuals relying more than ever on technology in their work and in their personal lives. But again, it highlights some of the skill shortages with Commonwealth and state governments emphasising the vital role of technology uh, in our economic recovery. We're finding that more and more demand for professionals across the whole range of the technology sphere is becoming acute uh, and we need to find solutions to this in the long term. An ambitious technology agenda allows universities such as UTS to draw on strengths and contribute to a more sustainable future through research and innovation. We are a public university of technology, recognised for our global impact. And at the heart of that also stands a commitment to social justice and our belief that social change to create a more just and equal world are at the forefront of things that we do. And we share 
these beliefs with the speakers tonight. Professor Stiglitz's work over the years hasn't been confined to a single specialisation. Instead, he's ensured his work has had the maximum socioeconomic benefit for individuals and for communities. And today, Professor Stiglitz will give his keynote address, followed by a discussion with Professor Baddeley and Professor Green, and we will uh, enjoy that conversation with an opportunity for questions later on in the evening. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our MC for this evening, is Emeritus Professor Roy Green, who is my special advisor in innovation and a former dean of the UTS Business School. Currently, Roy chairs the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Hub at the Port of Newcastle. He's a director of the Innovative Manufacturing Cooperative Research Centre and a member of the Research Advisory Board at the Centre of Policy Development, the Australian Design Council and New South Wales Modern Manufacturing Task Force. So retirement brings lots of opportunities, Roy. <laughs> uh, he um, has uh, led and participated in a number of these particular uh, fora and also is a significant commentator on public policy issues. He's chaired the Australian Government's Innovative Regions Centre, the CSIRO Manufacturing Sector Advisory Council, the New South Wales Manufacturing Industries Advisory Council and the Queensland Competition Authority. And to top it all off, he was a member of the Prime Minister's Manufacturing Task Force. So who better to lead the conversation tonight? Uh, would you join me in welcoming Roy Green? Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we're very privileged, of course, tonight uh, to have with us Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who uh, I, I suspect for most of us needs no introduction, but I will do so anyway very briefly. Um, he is um, obviously a Nobel Prize winning economist, Professor of Economics at Columbia University, but he also is co-chair of the High Level Expert Group on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress at the OECD and Chief Economist of the Roosevelt Institute. Um, he is a former Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank and a former Chairman of the US Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, he was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, and um, he is known among economists for his pioneering work on asymmetric information. Um, his research focuses, it's just uh, when we say focus, it's very wide ranging on income distribution, climate change, corporate governance, public policy, macroeconomics and globalization. He is the author of numerous books, including most recently, People, Power and Profits, Rewriting uh, the Rules of the European Economy. And uh, some years ago, um, many of you will be familiar with globalization and its discontents. And he's also written now, Globalization and its Discontents Revisited. So um, you don't want to hear from us. We'd r much rather hear from you, Joe. So over Thank to you. you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, the subject I wanted to talk about is uh, the role of government uh, in technology policy. Uh, and let me, I have basically just five points to make. Uh, the first is uh, just to remind everybody the importance of uh, technical progress, of innovation. Um, the, uh, we don't always appreciate that for hundreds of years, uh, before around 1750, 1800, standards of living uh, were uh, unchanged, uh, uh, little different in 1750 from what they were in the year, um, you know, 100 BC. Uh, the, there, there was really very little progress. And then suddenly, beginning around uh, uh, the late, latter part of the 18th century, uh, standards of living and life expectancies and every measure of well-being uh, started to increase uh, very dramatically. And uh, the answer why uh, has to do with science, technology, and uh, the ability uh, to organize complex societies to uh, deliver the benefits that science and technology uh, made possible. So th these are really ideas having to do with the Enlightenment, um, uh, 
an unusual period in history where uh, suddenly mindsets uh, changed to uh, understand that uh, progress was possible. Uh, another important part of, of uh, the Enlightenment, uh, I, I should mention, because this is a, a series uh, having to do with democracy, are uh, the whole set of uh, values having to do with tolerance and with, with a democratic organization of our society. Um, and uh, as important as these Enlightenment values are, uh, we, we should recognize that they are being challenged. Um, you probably don't feel it as much here as we feel it in the United States, but uh, our democracy is in a very fragile state. Uh, and uh, as some people say, we have to relitigate the Enlightenment every day. Uh, that what we thought of were well-established, well-accepted, uh, uh, beliefs about tolerance and, and about democracy and uh, uh, are uh, being questioned uh, by one of the major parties uh, in the United States. So uh, I just want to emphasize how important, uh, how important uh, advances in technology are to our well-being uh, and that what is at stake here is uh, every aspect of that well-being, including our democratic institutions and our economic well-being. Uh, the second uh, important idea I want to uh, highlight is that innovation is endogenous. It just doesn't come like mana from heaven. Uh, it, it, it is a result of people devoting efforts to thinking about uh, understanding the world, uh, how to make things uh, work better, um, of a concerted effort uh, to uh, get more outputs out of uh, any level of input. Um, so uh, uh, we, we, we can't take uh, innovation uh, for granted. Uh, because it is endogenous, it is, uh, it, we can either accelerate it, we can change the direction in which it goes, uh, uh, or we can undermine it. And then that comes to the third and, and, and maybe the most difficult set uh, of proposition. Um, Since Adam Smith uh, uh, talked about uh, the benefits of markets, uh, markets lead as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of uh, society, there's been a strong view among at least uh, uh, many economists that markets, uh, the pursuit of self-interest, the pursuit of uh, 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 of self-interest would lead uh, to the well-being uh, of society. And in many ways, uh, one of the most important achievements of economic science was establishing the conditions under which and the sense in which uh, Adam Smith's conjecture was correct. Uh, and that was done by Arrow and De Bru in the, uh, the 1950s, for which they got a no, uh, Nobel Prizes. Uh, and the interesting thing about their important work was that they showed that markets lead to efficient outcomes only under a highly restricted set of conditions. Uh, there can't be externalities like climate change, uh, there has to be high levels of competition, and markets are increasingly characterized by uh, a high levels of monopoly power or imperfections of competition. But uh, one of the strong assumptions, two of the strong assumptions uh, made by Arrow and De Bru that they had to make to get their results 
or that inf information was perfect, the markets were perfect, uh, perfect risk markets, and that there was no technological change or no endogenous technological change. Uh, one of the results of my own work, uh, particularly that with my colleague Bruce Greenwald at Columbia, uh, was that the reason it often seemed that the invisible hand was invisible was it wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> that markets were not really efficient. Uh, and the presumption of that unfettered markets would lead to the general well-being of society just was wrong. Uh, in general, the markets uh, did not deliver societal well, even efficiency, let alone a broader sense of social justice. Well, uh, what we're talking about uh, this afternoon is uh, innovation and uh, the assumption that Arrow and De Bru made was that uh, there was no innovation, or if there was innovation, it happened on its own. But the first two uh, comments I made were that innovation is really important, and it is endogenous. It is affected by our allocation resources to innovation. Well, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, we started looking at the question of uh, were markets efficient in either the, uh, the level of investment in, nature, in, in innovation or in the direction of innovation. I'll come explain in a minute what I mean. Uh, or in the way they did innovation. The answer came out very uh, unambiguous. Markets are efficient in not none of the, the key questions about innovation. Uh, that there was no presumption that what comes out of the uh, unfettered markets uh, was efficient. Now, uh, it is true that one, I mean the advocates of, of markets. Uh, have always said that one of the virtues of, of the market economy is that it spurs innovation. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, that was the uh, key idea of one of the, uh, uh, another great economist of the 20th century, Joseph Schumpeter. Um, and he argued uh, uh, forcefully that uh, this, uh, he said, well, there could be monopoly but competition to be the next monopolist spurred innovation and was uh, an important basis for uh, the increases in standard of living. Well, uh, there were many uh, ideas packed into his conclusion, uh, his argument, that uh, this uh, uh, competition to be the next monopolist uh, was, uh, would lead to efficiency, and it turned out when you looked at it more carefully, he was wrong. Uh, it, it is true that it can be a spur to innovation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a spur to the right kind of innovation, or that it was uh, the right level of spur, that it lead to the efficient level of investment in R&D. Uh, and uh, there are a whole variety of, of reasons that I uh, can't uh, go into uh, all of them uh, for why it is the case that markets on their own are not efficient in uh, either the level or direction uh, of innovation. Uh, let me just, uh, as an aside, what do I mean by the direction of innovation? Um, the, uh, uh, you can uh, decide to allocate more resources towards uh, uh, saving labor uh, or to saving the planet. 
uh, to climate change. Uh, or you can save skilled labor or unskilled labor. So there are many things you can try to, to many directions of research, uh, new products, uh, uh, which uh, uh, diseases do people uh, allocate resources. Um, and when you look at, at how uh, we, uh, maybe I, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story, but, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, the bottom line. Um, if you think about, you know, should we be spending more money on uh, research to save the planet or more money to save labor so we have more unskilled uh, labor unemployment? say in the United States, it's very clear uh, saving labor when there's already a lot of unemployment doesn't improve societal efficiency. But saving the planet could merely make a difference. Uh, and uh, so reducing uh, uh, innovations that reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, have an enormous social value. But until very recently, we've not been allocating resources in that direction. Once we started thinking about it, we started getting progress. The cost of renewable energy has fallen enormously in 10 or 15 years. But what's remarkable about it is most of that innovation is not based on breakthrough science. It's not like somebody you know, it's based on something that nobody knew about 15 years ago. They could have done it 25 years ago or 30 years ago. But what did they do? They put all their efforts into making sure we have more unemployment. Um, and you can understand that uh, more unemployment, saving labor, uh, 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 increases profits, um, reducing carbon emissions, you don't get any return for that. And that really uh, is uh, a key part of the argument for why markets are not efficient in the allocation uh, of R&D. And that is that um, social returns are not necessarily equal to private returns. There can be very big discrepancies between social and private returns. And there are many other uh, examples. Um, another uh, uh, example that uh, uh, comes to mind, uh, there are a whole host of examples in the, the medical care, uh, medical uh, in, in healthcare. Uh, we spend a lot of uh, money doing research on what are called Me Too um, me to uh, uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, you discover a drug that reduces, uh, say, ulcers, uh, that addresses ulcers. Uh, uh, and then a lot of money is, and then you get a patent on it, and then a lot of money is spent on getting another drug that's just different enough from the original drug so that you too can get a patent and divide the market. And if you're lucky and your advertising is better than the first guy's advertising, you'll even do better than the first guy. So what is the social value of the second drug? Almost zero. There's a little bit because some people will have less side effect from the second drug than the first drug. But uh, no, the, the minuscule social value. But you ask a question about, uh, you know, and, and we do, m our drug companies did far more, spent far more money on uh, issues like uh, making sure that uh, hair loss was reduced, Rogaine. Um, <laughs> uh, I never took it, but uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I should have. But, but anyway, they, they, then they did on malaria. Millions of people were dying every year from malaria. But unfortunately, the people who were dying from malaria were in Africa 
and other places that were poor. So from their point of view, there's no money in that. And the people who were worried about losing hair were in the rich countries, and a lot of money in that. So from any social point of view, you'd say, you know, what's more important? Millions of people dying from malaria or few people being sensitive about the amount of hair they have on, on their head. Well, I think most of us would say that dying from malaria is far more important than, than hair loss. But our drug companies, they follow the money and they were totally uninterested in uh, 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 malaria. Um, I can go through lots of other examples of that kind where the direction of innovation is uh, not socially optimal and for an obvious reason that the private returns are different from any uh, assessment of uh, the social returns. Uh, there are other reasons that uh, uh, the private uh, market is uh, de it, it often is not adequate uh, in addressing key issues of uh, innovation. Um, some of the, uh, when we talk about uh, innovation, it's not only the, the direction of innovation, it's the kind of innovation, uh, about whether you make small innovations or big innovations. And the problem with big innovations, they tend to be expensive and uh, risky. And markets are not very good at handling risk, and capital markets tend not to be uh, very well designed for handling that kind of risk. Uh, very hard to collateralize uh, the, the lending. Um, there are uh, problems of uh, asymmetries of information. If I have a brilliant idea, and uh, I want to go and get, uh, this is a, a common problem in Silicon Valley. Uh, I want to get money, uh, uh, funders to provide me money. Uh, one of the problems is that to get somebody to give you money for your brilliant idea, uh, what do you have to do? Well, you have to convince them, and that means to convince them, you have to tell them your idea. And what do you think happens? Now, Americans are very moral, <laughs> but money often overcomes their morality. <laughs> so you tell them the, your idea, and what do they say? Oh, I already had that idea. And of course they didn't, but they then take your idea and run off and uh, patent it. So uh, I know it sounds scandalous, uh, that these things happen, but they happen all the time. And so it's very hard to raise money because in the process of raising money, you share your idea and that loses you your, your um, uh, ability to uh, make money from your idea. So uh, if you look around, uh, some of the most important innovations uh, they've come from the public sector. Uh, the, the, you know, the private sector is important. Uh, it makes important innovations like post-its. Nobody, uh, 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 yeah, it, 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 we all use it, and, and I think you're using yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, important innovations, but if you look at the really important innovations like the internet, uh, it was financed by government. You look at the first browser, on the internet, financed by the US government. We were all saved in uh, COVID-19 by mRNA vaccines. Who paid for the mRNA platform, the idea? It was government that, in a research, University of Pennsylvania, a Hungarian woman, who developed the mRNA idea. And then who put all the money to make sure that it was translated, this idea was translated into 
uh, a COVID-19, uh, a vaccine for COVID-19. It was uh, the U.S. government uh, and government in, in Germany and, and in other countries. So, uh, you know, in the end, the last mile, uh, a few companies like Pfizer did put in a lot of money, but it was a minuscule fraction of the money. And the president of Pfizer would like you to believe that he did everything himself. <laughs> and he said, oh, I didn't get any money. And that was because the public provided the money for the platform, provided the money for the development of the vaccine, and he brought it to the market. Yeah, it was an important contribution, but he was resting on oodles and oodles of public money. And you would not have gotten the private sector. The private sector just didn't do it. So, um, uh, these are uh, some of the reasons, and fundamentally, uh, it's inefficient to have technology provided by the private sector. Why do I say that? Well, one of the important attributes of knowledge uh, science uh, is that it's what we call technically is a public good. Uh, what we mean by a public good is uh, there's no marginal cost to another person using it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was our third president in the United States, uh, put it much more poetically when he said, knowledge was like a candle. When one candle likes another candle, it doesn't diminish from the light of the first candle. And uh, that was a way of saying that knowledge is very different from a conventional good like steel or anything you eat. Uh, uh, if one person uh, eats something, somebody else can't eat it. Uh, but uh, if I've just told you something, I know it, you know it, but I still know it. So it hasn't diminished from what I know. And the nature of a public good is that efficiency requires that the knowledge be used as widely as possible. But if it's used as widely as possible, that means you can't privatize it. And that means it needs to be in the public domain. And that means government has to play an important role in the provision, particularly of basic uh, knowledge, basic science, basic technology. Uh, and uh, this is a, 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 a more general point. Um, as we become a more science-based economy, it means that the role of government will have to get larger. We need to be spending more money on basic research. And that means the government has to provide more support, and we need a larger public sector. So uh, the more that we are a science-based society, if we want efficiency, we have to have a larger public sector. Well, uh, the fourth point is, uh, I've already, uh, uh, made it already, not only does the private sector uh, not lead to an efficient allocation uh, of resources to technology, uh, uh, both in di pace, direction, uh, the nature of the research, um, the government has actually done a remarkably good job in allocating money to uh, research. Um, the critics of government often point to the failures. Uh, examples where government put money into a research project and it didn't work out. Uh, my view is that if there were no failures, that itself would be a failure. That is to say, you want, the nature of, re of research is that it's a, a inquiry into the unknown. And by its nature, because it's an inquiry into the unknown, you don't know what's going to be successful or a failure. Anybody who's done research know that you, you go down a lot of uh, 
bad rabbit holes. You know, a lot of, a lot of your time is spent, is wasted. I mean, not wasted, but doesn't lead to results that you would, you had hoped. But you don't know that until you've done, and, until you've gone through the research. Uh, that's the nature of research, that you, you are, succeed only after many failures. <laughs> and so the fact, if, if government, every project was successful, it would be evidence that we were spending much too little money. Um, that uh, we, we uh, need, uh, we, we should expect failures as well as successes. Um, in uh, the United States, uh, recently there was a lot of discussion about our support for uh, various uh, uh, projects related to uh, uh, global warming, you know, and people point out uh, uh, one of the failures was a, a, a Solinara, uh, a, a particular uh, 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 solar panel uh, effort. But what they don't point out is Tesla, which has been an enormous success as an electric car, uh, only exists because the government gave it a bundle of money. And uh, the one criticism I have of what the government did is that it gave it that money rather than getting shares. Uh, if it had gotten shares, uh, which is what we, a lot of us recommended that it do, uh, the U.S. government would have made a huge amount of money out of it. So there is a criticism of what we've done. It's not that we misallocated the money. We didn't get the return for the public on the money that we, we uh, allocated. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, when, when I was... Uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, we, di we did a, uh, a, re uh, a study of the average re return to our investments in R&D and technology. And it was enormous. It was higher than the private sector return on R&D, higher than the private re sector return in general on capital. Uh, it, it was a very high uh, return. So uh, sometimes the argument is uh, government can't pick winners. The answer is uh, the government has been remarkably successful on average in getting uh, high return investments. Um, well, uh, the final point I want to make is um, government uh, has to uh, not only do ex uh, support uh, basic research, uh, but it also has to steer the direction of the private sector. I said before that the private sector on its own doesn't uh, direct the allocation of uh, resources to R&D in a way that is uh, efficient. Um, and uh, 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 that means it has to be uh, directed, steered. And there are many instruments for steering the private sector. Now, uh, the subject of industrial policy, which is industry policy of, of steering the economy, uh, has been very controversial uh, in the last 40 years, uh, of the 40 years of neoliberalism. People said, you know, government shouldn't be engaged in, in doing that. Uh, the first point I want to make is that governments always are steering the economy. You can't not steer the economy. Every time you make a decision about infrastructure, uh, putting a road one place rather than another, building a port or not building a port, has consequences for where the economy is going. So whether you like it or not, uh, you are steering the economy. Uh, the same thing goes well, how much you spend on education. 
uh, whether you spend education. If you don't spend money on education, you are steering the economy towards a well-educated uh, 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 economy. Uh, so uh, whether you like it or not, you are always steering the economy. Unfortunately, because you don't think about it, because it, people don't think about it, what happens is special interests tend to steer the economy. So the United States had a very strong policy of steering the economy, but didn't recognize it. How were we steering the economy? To the financial sector, to derivatives that exploded and brought us 2008 and the global financial crisis. Um, we did little things like a rule that said that if you go bankrupt, the derivatives get paid before anybody else. So that made derivatives more secure than anything else. And it was an explicit statement, we want to encourage derivatives. Now you might ask, why in the world would you want to encourage these risky products that exploded all the time? Well, you don't want to, but there were special interests who wanted to promote these risky products, the derivatives. And because nobody else was paying, nobody was paying attention, they got it through Congress. So the point I want to make is that uh, every economy is, every society is steering the economy, but because you don't have an open discussion about where you want to steer it, it often is steered by special interests. Where do we want to steer our economy right now? I think we want to steer it to in directions for uh, a greener transition, for a, a more inclusive economy. There, there are lots of things that uh, the market on its own won't do, and we need to steer it. There are many instruments that we have available. I spent a lot of time talking so far about uh, basic research as a instrument of, of uh, if you support basic research in one direction, that facilitates the economy moving in that direction. Uh, another uh, thing that you can uh, um, uh, do is uh, education policy and tax policy. Uh, where you encourage, uh, uh, how you direct educational resources affects the direction society is going to be 20, 30 years from now. Uh, tax policy, uh, an example, uh, we should be uh, encouraging, uh, as I said before, we should be encouraging uh, research to uh, save the planet, which means reduce carbon emissions. If we had a tax on carbon emissions, that would encourage, and were stronger regulations on carbon emissions, that would encourage research for reducing carbon emissions. What we have is a tax on labor. So what does that do? It encourages saving labor. So. We have a tax structure that encourages uh, saving of labor to get more unemployment of labor, and a tax structure that doesn't encourage saving the planet. So that's an example of how you can use tax policy to steer uh, the uh, uh, economy. There's been a, a, a fundamental change in attitudes towards uh, uh, industry policy, towards steering. Um, and uh, it's so interesting for me to watch this, because I, I've been advocating these ideas for a very long time. But now, even the Republicans in the United States agree that we need industry policy. Uh, and it has been, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, 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 talked a lot by the Biden uh, administration. So uh, the, uh, there's been really a revolution in thinking in economics about uh, steering the economy, and in particular, 
steering um, uh, innovation. And uh, that brings me to, to the final point. Um, uh, the uh, government here is beginning to talk about uh, well-being budgeting. Uh, budgeting money to uh, ensure that uh, you not just increase GDP, but you increase well-being more broadly. And that's really uh, a general part of, uh, or a, a broader aspect of what I'm talking about uh, here, that you want, uh, you all the examples that I've told about how the market may be maximizing profits, but it isn't maximizing societal well-being. And that the objective of economic policy is not to maximize GDP, but it's to maximize societal well-being. And there are many instances where those two are not congruent. And uh, in a world of scarcity, we have to make sure that every dollar is well spent. And that, that means that it does multiple objectives, climate change, inclusiveness, inequality, diversity. Uh, and um, technology policy is an important part uh, of uh, public policy. And what I hope I've done uh, this afternoon is to try to give you some arguments uh, some, uh, for why it is that a technology policy that promotes innovation that is focused around promoting societal well-being should be an important part of government policy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that incredibly insightful address, Joe. Uh, and now it's time to turn to our conversation and I'd like to introduce Professor Mich Michelle Badley, who is Professor of Economics and Associate Dean Research at the UTS Business School. Uh, Michelle is an expert in behavioral economics and behavioral finance. Uh, she has an economics degree from University of Queensland and a PhD from Cambridge. Um, She's also director of the new Centre for Livelihoods and Wellbeing, uh, which uh, Joe just referred to at the end, um, at UTS and also president of the Society for the Advancement of Behavioural Economics and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Behavioural Economics for Policy. Uh, she has many other um, university and uh, professional affiliations, which I won't go into. Uh, suffice it to say that Michelle specialises in the application of behavioural insights across a range of themes relevant to people's economic and financial decision-making. And uh, we'll now start our conversation with you, Joe, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions from the audience as well. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Roy. Um, thank you, Joe. That was such a rich um, outline of... You, you, I whistle-stop tour of economics underneath all of that. Uh, everything from efficiency right through to well-being. So I have so many questions I could ask, but I'll, I'll try to be a bit focused and obviously g give everyone a turn. Um, so to starting with some of the, the earlier points um, about efficiency, and when I first started with economics, the focus on efficiency, one, one thing that was made clear is that, certainly at that time, economists sort of sidestepped distributional issues. And so you can, the arrow de Bruyne can very cleverly show with, with clever mathematics that how to find an efficient solution, but it, it's completely silent on distribution. And so a lot of what you're talking about is how the, you know, the distribution, not just in, in monetary terms or in money terms, but also leading into the themes around well-being. These sorts of distributional well-being issues are something that economists you know, are, are relatively new to in many ways. Uh, so what, what's your view of how ec economics as a profession could learn to or, or engage with these sorts of insights 
more deeply, especially because something like well-being is difficult to quantify. Yeah, so first of all, one of the reasons that economists didn't, uh, maybe an excuse for economists, not talking about distribution, uh, and let me say, the, it, it wasn't just that they were, didn't talk about it, uh, they were hostile to talking about it. Uh, there's a, a, a famous quote from Bob Lugas, who's a Chicago uh, economist, Nobel laureate, um, who said, of all the things that is most poisonous to talk about, uh, distribution uh, is uh, the most poisonous. Um, so he, he was really hostile to even talking about distribution. And behind it, uh, that was uh, another theorem, in a way, uh, which was that if you didn't like the distribution of income, uh, you just have lump sum redistributions, and you take money from one person in a lump sum way, and you give it to another person, and uh, that redistribution uh, was a matter of politics, not a matter of economics. Mm. And uh, where he went wrong, uh, in, I mean, he went wrong in so many ways, so I, uh, but uh, among the things where he went wrong was first, that theorem that you could separate out distribution from efficiency it's just wrong. Mm, yeah. um, that uh, there don't exist these lump sum taxes. Mm. Uh, that every tax has uh, distribution consequences. Um, we, you know, there, there, uh, in a world of imperfect information, you can't uh, separate uh, uh, the two. Um, and. Uh, the, there's a general uh, empirical result that people now uh, call it a lot of attention to, uh, and it was really the center of w one of my books, uh, which was called The Price of Inequality. Mm. And one of the arguments I made in the, uh, that book was that inequality actually led itself directly to lower poor economic performance. So that distribution couldn't be put in a separate bucket from overall economic mm. performance. Uh, and there are a whole set of, of, of reasons uh, for that. Uh, uh, one obvious, uh, one example is that um, if you have a lot of inequality, the people at the bottom N never are able to live up to their potential. Mm. And so you're wasting uh, one of your most valuable resources, your human resources. Mm. And so you, you just can't separate out uh, uh, the two. So the, um, that idea that we could ignore distribution uh, which was the predicate a lot, uh, on, uh, uh, on the basis of which a lot of economists did that, mm. was wrong. Mm. Yeah. And, and that sort of underpins a lot of you what you were saying as well, so the, an, I an idea from economics. Well, economists often are described in quite simplistic ways, in which I don't necessarily identify with, but Economists have been exploring for a long time issues around efficiency wages and disguised unemployment and underemployment, all these sorts of things, which underpin this idea that absolutely you address inequality and everyone's a winner in, in a sense. But I guess economists make assumptions in theory that maybe even the economists don't believe themselves, and yet they get seized by vested interests. The results get seized by vested interests, which is another theme within a lot of what you were saying before is that the, the power of vested interests. Um, how optimistic are you about a democratic political system being able to develop countervailing powers to these vested interests, particularly in the context of 
uh, I'm generalizing, but an ordinary person is much more cynical about government than they are about McDonald's or, you know, the, the big, or Big Pharma or whatever. And, and that allows these big, powerful economic groups more influence than maybe they yeah, should I think, ideally have. I think, uh, uh, let, let me talk about, first, a little bit from an American perspective, mm. because uh, our private sector has achieved uh, the ability to have equal citizenship with the prob public sector. Um, <laughs> It took a lot of work, but uh, when you combine uh, the abuses of the financial sector in 2008 with the opioid crisis, uh, with the food uh, companies giving rise to uh, the epidemic of childhood diabetes, with uh, Volkswagen lying about uh, mm -hmm. the diesel gate, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, oil companies uh, uh, supporting uh, NGOs claiming there's no such thing as climate change, uh, with the tobacco companies saying that their products are not addictive, uh, you have a really concerted effort to undermine confidence in the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, and then you have uh, uh, Facebook, and, and all the harms that it's done. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, what is quite remarkable is uh, the large fraction of probably a majority of the students going into business school don't believe in capitalism anymore. Um, so uh, we, we now have a, a balance of skepticism on both the public and, and the private sector. Now, I think, and obviously, if our society is going to work, we're, we're, we're going to have to get more trust. Mm. Yes. Uh, There's something I was thinking as well as you were talking, the, the role of trust and, and trusting the right people. Yeah. yeah. And, and now, a fundamental problem that we're dealing with uh, in one of the two parties is uh, they don't believe in truth. Mm. And, and mis- and disinformation has been elevated. Mm. Uh, mm. You know. Uh, you get to believe whatever you want. Mm. Um, and you can say, well, I saw it on the internet. You can see anything on the internet. Uh, uh, and people say, oh, I did my own research. What does that mean? I, I looked at the winter, inter internet and found somebody who agreed with me. Mm. Uh, vaccines mm. are dangerous or, you know. Uh, in, but, uh, and that goes to the point of, I made about relitigating the, the Enlightenment mm. Uh, mm. and a constant that, that we have ways, w there is a meaning of truth. We, we may not be perfectly certain that the world is not flat, mm, mm. but we're pretty sure. Yeah. And we even have pictures of, of you know, from out of, that, that it looks, you know, sort of spherical. Mm. Um, there is a flat earth society, and you go on the internet, you can mm. find somebody giving an argument about the earth being flat, but that doesn't mean that they're equally Mm -hmm. Weighted. Um, I think uh, th this talks about the importance of, of education on the one hand, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, importance of transparency, mm -hmm. uh, of, of being able to see what is going on, uh, not having uh, secrets. But also, it was about government regulation because I think. Uh, one of the big challenges that we are going to be facing is dealing with the problem uh, going forward is dealing with mis- and disinformation in a way that is consistent with what we call First Amendment rights, uh, free speech, yeah, and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And that, that point about regulation and how to regulate information, how to regulate the internet when it's a globalized thing, starting to touch on some of your other yeah. work on, the on themes of globalization. There's so much to ask, I won't monopolise yes, you. Sadly, <laughs> we're reaching the end of our time and we've probably got another dozen questions to ask, but we're going to curb our enthusiasm um, and um, just um, ask um, everyone out there whether you have a question. I, I think we can take one or two before we end. Yes, over there. If you could, um, there's a microphone coming, if you could just... Tell us who you are and then ask the question. Thank you. 
Good evening. Can you hear me? That yes. Time, thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm a retired teacher, currently living in northern New South Wales, which is a bit of a floodland these days, like a lot of the east coast of New South Wales. Many years ago, I was teaching courses on war and peace in a changing world, and we're talking about the role of the government in promoting, in, shall I say, uh, web in research and technology into weaponry in the world, in particular in the US, where an overwhelming majority of your scientists were locked into the industrial military complex. The other evening, one of your colleagues, Bruce Shapiro from Columbia, was talking about last weekend you had seven, no, you had 12, I should say, mass shootings in the United States. And the addiction to weaponry and the armaments in the US and government investment into that industry is the driving force of so many of the innovations we have these days in the, in the world from Velcros onwards. Um, do you see that changing in the future? Is it as bad now as it was back in the height of the Cold War, say in the 1980s, with Star Wars and all that? Do you see a change in research and development in the US into well-being and civilian needs rather than military needs? Thank you. Yeah. Um one of the interesting things uh, about uh, the uh, research that went on uh, in the industrial, uh, in the military industrial, the military, uh, was uh, how much of it turned out uh, to be directed to broader societal. The military was less militaristic than a lot of people realized. So the internet for instance, was developed uh, under, by DARPA, uh, by, uh, by the US military. And one of its attributes, uh, which is its very decentralized nature, which a lot of people, you know, libertarians like, was done deliberately because they were afraid a centralized system could be attacked. And they wanted a system that was immune from an easy uh, attack. So it's interesting that that out of you know out of that military came some things that have really transformed our society, uh, and uh, you know one of the things when people uh, say uh, talked about industrial policy or you know industry policy, uh, um, U.S. always had industry policy, but it was just hidden in our Defense Department. Now, uh, the, uh, and it was the only way you could get money for it, but the military knew that it wasn't spending money on just military things. They, they understood the broader uh, context uh, of what they were doing. Um, I think the big change is climate change uh, because it is existential. And uh, we are now doing an awful, the government is spending a lot of money on research on climate change. Health is also a big, become very big. So I think um, as we start thinking about two things people care a lot about, uh, health and the environment, uh, those are really nothing, you know, quite apart from military and have become a, a, a very big part of our innovation budget. And so I think we are moving away from uh, this uh, single focus on, on military uh, as the vehicle for supporting research. Well, I think we're going to have to end things there. I'm very sorry that we can't take any more questions, but um, as um, Professor Stiglitz pointed out, we have to reassert the values of the Enlightenment almost every day, and uh, we've had a very good example of that tonight. I'd like to thank, firstly, uh, the Australia Institute for uh, bringing Professor Stiglitz to Australia. Uh, he has a very busy schedule um, over the next week around the country. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, Vice-Chancellor, who tore himself away from the University's Australia Conference to be here. That wasn't very difficult to do, by the way. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, very um, efficient and fantastic UTS events team. And, of course, you, Joe. Thank you so much for being with us.
Yeah. It's been a fantastic evening, a fantastic conversation. And thank you, for Michelle, for participating. And thank you, everyone, for coming along tonight.